look at the reactions of carboxylic acid anhydrides. And so anhydrides, as we'll refer to them here on out, are um, the second most reactive carboxylic acid derivative that we're going to look at. And it is going to be a functional group just like acid halides that don't need carbonyl activation in order to get both good anionic nucleophiles and protonated nucleophiles, weaker nucleophiles, to add directly to the carbonyl. Okay, and so in general, our reactions are going to look like uh, these two in the box here. We're going to have a nucleophile add and kick off a carboxylate if we have an anionic, and we'll kick off a carboxylic acid if we have a protonated nucleophile. And that carboxylic acid may or may not be in equilibrium to um, with its carboxylate uh, conjugate base. It just depends on the pH of your final solution um, from there. And so if we look at these, these are pretty exothermic because of how reactive they are. And so we should make sure to be safe and control the temperature of reactions involving anhydrides if we find ourselves using these in the lab. All right, so again, we said they're the second most reactive carboxylic acid derivative. Let's look at why. It's because they've got such a good leaving group. And so the acid bromides, acid chlorides, and anhydrides will all be able to react without needing acid activation. So we'll have a direct nucleophilic attack um, to kick off a bromide chloride or a carboxylate leaving group. Whether those get protonated at the end depends on the identity of the nucleophile, um, but initially in the tetrahedral intermediate will kick off one of these um, good nucleophiles. Okay, and so because the acetate or carboxylate um, leaving group is not quite as good as bromide and chloride, it's the conjugate base of a weak acid rather than a strong acid, and so the um, carboxylate here does require um, a little bit more reaction time, more reactive, slightly than the acid halides, but we'll see functionally they tend to react similarly, okay? And so we'll take a look at esters having a slightly worse leaving group, needing activation um, when a weak nucleophile is used like water or an alcohol, and we'll see the same thing for amides and nitriles. They need further activation and heating um, to get those to react. And then the bookend here, the least reactive would be the carboxylate, which has an overall negative charge that repels nucleophiles. But if we want to use the carboxylate as a nucleophile, that's a good use for it. It's a good nucleophile weak base, so it's good at SN2 reactions and it's good here for carbonyl additions. And so here's a, rea a reaction that um, we won't look at the mechanism of, it's fairly simple, but it adds to the acid halide that we have here to form our anhydride functional group. Okay, and so there's our anhydride. It's got two carboxylic acid type groups together, but there's a water missing in the middle. We'll see that more in the second reaction here coming up. But this acid halide does donate this additional um, carbonyl group here to that carboxylate. And if you look at it, um, the reactions of acid halides and, car and, and hydrides are very similar. So why might you want to do this reaction? Well, it turns out that acid halides are not the greatest um, functional groups to isolate and store. Acid and hydrides are a little less reactive, a little more stable. Sometimes you can convert um, an acid halide into an anhydride and thereby make it more um, stable to isolation and um, storage and so may and it functionally does pretty similar and uh, as far as reactions go it'll behave the same way so that may be a reason you would use it in a real lab type situation um, but functionally they tend to be interchangeable for the most part okay and if we look at uh, the most common reaction for making an anhydride we would use two carboxylic acids whether they're the same or two different it's more efficient if they're the same and we would heat this, ideally um, using Le Chatelier's principle, because this is highly reversible here, to drive off or distill away the anhydride functional group, which would have a lower boiling point. So these hydrogen bonding OHs on a carboxylic acid drastically increase the boiling point. So we might isolate this with an anhydride, but we can make the reaction irreversible and not have to do that if we use a drying agent such as phosphorus pentoxide um, to 
basically grab and dehydrate the reaction, pull the water out and drive us to completion here uh, for the anhydride synthesis. So heat and P2O5 would be my recommendation, but technically you only have to use heat if you prepare well to isolate the anhydride. Okay, so let's look at the reactions. Um, you can see that I actually prepared this one from the acyl halides there, so acid anhydrides um, have a very similar reaction profile to the acid halides. Um, when reacting with an anionic nucleophile like an alkoxide, here we've got methoxide, they form esters with the same mechanism type. We have a leaving group, um, a nucleophile that we saw with the acid halides. So let's take a look at it right quick here. Um, to make our ester in a reaction known as um, alcoholysis here, or al alcoholysis would be for the methoxide. And so if we take our alkoxide here, attack one of the two carbonyls, doesn't matter which, we form a tetrahedral intermediate. So we look at that and decide, we just added the methoxide, there it is. And then on the other end, we have our acetate. And so at this point, um, we look at our leaving groups, and the best leaving group is indeed the acetate here. And so we would show that as leaving irreversibly here to form our ester in a, in a uh, two mechanistic steps. The byproduct um, would then be the acetate or the carboxylate here. We just keep track of that um, just to note that it's there helps us with the mechanism but we don't technically have to include a byproduct on a line reaction unless requested on my exam but again you make sure that you pay attention to what the question's asking all right so if we do the same thing with hydroxide it's called hydrolysis because we're sort of cutting it with water um, hydroxide would add in the same way and it would kick off the carboxylate and you get some proton exchange and, and notice that these are actually conjugate acid and conjugate base of one another when the um, anhydride is symmetrical like this. Okay, so we get two equivalents essentially if we lower the pH and protonate both um, of our species in solution. We can also add organometallics to anhydrides in the same way we did acid halides. We showed a Grignard with the acid halide. Let's show an organolithium here. The, uh, what makes all three of these similar is that we have a very polar metal to carbon bond so that we can functionally think of the carbon of our or organometallic as being a, a carbanion. So it's got a negative charge on carbon. And if we look at the mechanism here, we're going to notice that we initially go through a single addition. I'm just going to draw the carbon lithium bond here. There it is, going to attack. We could equivalently show this as the carbanion attacking. So if we didn't show the covalent bond, show that we've got a carbanion, we could attack with that as well, no problem. We form a tetrahedral intermediate, which cannot reverse because it only has one leaving group. The carbon group is a very poor leaving group indeed, uh, but the acetate is not. And so what it'll do, the carbonyl will reform here and then kick off the carboxylate and we get a ketone for a moment. And yes, anhydrides are more reactive than ketones, but um, in practice we end up getting a very fast reaction as well with um, a second equivalent of organometallic and so it's not always the best um, for a direct addition it's a poor yield to go after the ketone and so this is a more reasonable reaction to do a second addition which is why we have the times two here or excess you could say um, to form the tertiary now alkoxide where we've added two groups and so then what step two of the mechanism here is is to protonate that alcohol, we've got hydronium, from any acid source that's strong enough to protonate an alcohol. So at minimum, and, and we could use ammonium chloride um, aqueous here, we could, 
use saturated ammonium chloride. We could use HCl. You just wouldn't want to overcook it with HCl. These step twos that we see for these reactions are workup steps. So we're monitoring the pH, lowering the pH to a point where we've protonated the alcohol, but not so much that it continues to react in a substitution type reaction. So this is a, an aqueous acid workup. Ammonium chloride is pretty common for this. But we get a tertiary alcohol out of it on adding two carbon groups. And so the two carbon groups we added with vinyl lithium would actually give us here um, two vinyl groups. And then the original methyl would stay on as well, but we'd end up with two vinyl groups. That looks a little bit interesting as far as um, a doubly allylic position on that alcohol. Not something we've seen too much of. It's versatile, okay? So it's some versatile reaction for us. Now, if we continue and look at poor nucleophiles, so a protonated or neutral nucleophile, we can do the same types of reactions. The pH is a little different, but again, anhydrides are reactive enough to react without acid activation. And so we can take a poor nucleophile like water. This time I'll attack the right-hand side. It's exactly equivalent. Kick up to our tetrahedral intermediate. Um, at this point, the leaving groups are similar to one another. And so I'm going to draw this as reversible to a certain degree because we need a proton to be removed by some base from solution. Doesn't matter what it is, just any lone pair capable of handling that proton to reduce the leaving group ability of water there, make it a hydroxyl. So here's our tetrahedral intermediate number two. Now we've got a clear winner, a good leaving group, an irreversible elimination at the end to kick off acetate versus hydroxide, and carbon's always a poor leaving group, a negligible leaving group. We won't invoke that at all. What do we get? Well, we get our carboxylic acid, sorry. Um, and then our leaving group that we just kicked off is a second equivalent of that very same carboxylic acid. Um, and with that base from solution, it's gonna be uh, being protonated here. So we had a byproduct in that step, some base that was protonated, may even be a carboxylate. Um, it's going to be in equilibrium with its conjugate acid. And so we just formally, we get a formal equivalent of a second acetic acid. We may wanna lower the pH to be sure that we isolate both in practice, but as far as an exam situation, we'll consider it two equivalents of the proton on. With alcohols, it's the same mechanism. We just react to form an ester instead of a carboxylic acid. So if we use ethanol, we would kick off um, our carboxylic acid and then put the ethyl ester onto our anhydride, just like we would with an acyl halide. And with amines, aminolysis, cleavage by an, an amine, if we want a primary amide, meaning there's no other carbon group attached to nitrogen but the carbonyl, we'd use ammonia. Again, we have to use excess for this one because of the um, basic nature of amines. We end up protonating a second equivalent during the mechanistic pathway. We'll show it here just to make sure we're reminded of that, we again attack directly to the carbonyl, kick up here to our tetrahedral intermediate. And now we've got an ammonium ion here that is acidic enough for a second equivalent of that amine to lose its nucleophile ability by acting as a base and it ends up getting protonated so that lone pair is gone. And then we can do our elimination. But if we want the reaction to keep going, we'd need, we'd need a, that second equivalent to be um, an additional equivalent rather than taking away half of our nucleophile um, from solution. So at this point, we have a clear best leaving group and so we get a collapse there to the carbonyl, kick off of acetate, and ultimately an irreversible elimination to the primary amide. Overall, we would end up with a byproduct of ammonium generated uh, here, okay?
and then we would have the carboxylate generated in the last step. They'd probably remain separated because um, the base strength of ammonia would, um, would react with the acid of the carboxylate. Okay, and if we want a secondary amide, so another carbon group, an N substituted amide, we would end up with uh, using a, excuse me, a primary amine as our reactant amine. And if we wanted a tertiary amide, we'd use a secondary amine um, in two equivalents to create our uh, tertiary amide. Okay, same mechanism, just different identity of the starting amine.